The three most important features of the, of the T3 are, first of all, broadband balance. As I said before, you've got to get the odd harmonics to the diodes, therefore it should be broad. The second is the generation of that square wave. Uh, how do you do it at microwave frequencies? I'll describe in a second. It turns out it's not that hard. <coughs> and then the final piece, and it involves the most hand waving, but it has to do with this idea of feedback linearization. As I showed on the last slide, normal diode mixers have this nasty feature that the harder you drive them, the more they forward bias themselves. And the key is to never let the diodes operate in that regime. You have to have a feedback in the mixer that senses the incoming power and adjusts the level. And this is all done uh, basically through um, the structure of the circuit and, and careful tuning of the elements. So as a diode mixer company, the byproduct of that is that you get to be really good at making mixer or making balance. And so we actually have a full line of balance. I'm not here to sell our balance. I'm just here to point out that it's possible to make balance that go from literally a few few kilohertz, hundreds of kilohertz, to 67 gigahertz in a single product. And so it, it's not a leap of faith to think, well, why not just put that into the T3 mixer and then let it fly? And that's essentially what we're doing. One of the things about making broadband balance, though, and this is something that I think academics don't like about them, and why you don't see a lot of good work in it, I think, uh, in the literature, is that they're nasty to simulate. If you want to take something below a gigahertz, you have to use magne magnetic permeability to assist you at the lower frequencies. However, I I've looked around, and if you go look at the ferrite companies, they never characterize their materials below maybe a few megahertz. So there's an entire megahertz to 60 gigahertz region where you actually don't know what the complex mu and epsilon are, and you'd have to go and go test it yourself. That's not a trivial thing to do. Um, it can be done. Um, but we haven't done it yet, and frankly, most of these designs are pure art. It's just trial and error. So how do we generate the square wave? The square wave can be generated one of two fairly straightforward ways. The first way that we use most is just to use a broadband distributed amplifier. This is a very common amplifier topology. It's well known. Um, you gang up a bunch of cascodes in, a, in series. You tune up the the inductance between those different stages, and you can get DC to, DC to daylight performance. It's the way that we amplify, for example, fiber optic signals. If we slightly saturate these types of amplifiers, they tend to, they tend to create faster rise time at the output. So if I take a 40 gigahertz amplifier and I saturate it, let's say, at the, about the 2 or 3 dB saturation point, I can take a rise time that may have been 50 picoseconds and turn it into 10 picoseconds. And the output could swing could be as much as 8 or 10 volts peak to peak. And that's more than enough to drive a T3 mixer. The other way that you can create a fast rise time square wave is to use some kind of digital logic or uh, limiting amplifier. And this works really well. This is actually how they do it in, in silicon ICs. So let's compare the square wave versus the sine wave in a T3. And what you see is that that approximation that Walker made is not that bad, actually. If you, it's definitely qualitatively close, and even quantitatively, depending on if you have your assumptions correct. So we can see a massive improvement. And what we also see is that the T3, even with just a sine wave, tends to be better than regular mixers, even with very high-level diodes. So the final tenant of the T3 mixer, which is the most hand-waving, is this concept of feedback linearization. And like I said earlier, regular mixers forward bias themselves with the rectified current, and they start to operate very poorly. And T3s are tuned in such a way that the more, you in, the more LO drive you input, the more feedback to reset the diodes to, a, to an optimal linear state. And um, that's unfortunately about all I can tell you about this. But um, suffice to say, without this, and we've done the experiment many times in many different um, uh, permutations, but without the feedback, the benefits of square wave driving are not very good. So you can see that uh, the T3 um, it has 
comprehensive coverage all the way through 40 gigahertz actually. Uh, we can take a unit that, we can take a high IP3 diode mixer, like a double balance mixer with a very high level diode that might offer 25 dBm input intercept and we can turn that into 40 in a T3. Here's an explanation of how good it can get when it comes to uh, rise time and power. You can see that in the lower right hand corner we have a sine wave drive with a re sorry, reasonably low LO signal. 15 dBm into the T3 is towards the bottom end of the range. And as we increase that by 10 dB and increase the amount of harmonics we inject into the mixer, we can dramatically improve the IP3. So how good, is this, how good is this compared to other types of mixers on the market? Um, well, this is what we used to make. Um, diode mixers can be about 25 dBm input intercept plus or minus. Um, you can play tricks to make it higher, but if you want to make it really broadband, you might have some problems. Here's a silicon on sapphire FET quad. This is a passive FET type switching mixer. It does pretty well for itself. There's a, a mess FET type. There's a bi CMOS type, and these are basically just examples that I, I did a Google search and I typed high IP3 mixer, and this is like the top two pages. This is what I found. And then, of course, there's the T3. The T3 in a single unit that goes 10 megahertz to 20 gigahertz can offer you almost 40 dBm input intercept the entire way. Now, that's if you engineer the LO drive. If you just inject a sine wave, it'll be good, but it's not going to be this good. What's really interesting though about the T3 is because the balance are created in such a way to be as broadband as possible, I can cover 10 megahertz to 40 gigahertz in two designs. One that takes me all the way to 20 and then another one that will take me all the way to 40 from there. And the whole time we're doing this with conversion losses around 6, 7, 8 dB. So on an output referred basis, which is actually the most important uh, metric for passive mixers. On an output referred basis, these mixers are incredibly efficient and high dynamic range. If I had made the, a, a direct comparison with like, for example, the silicon on sapphire FET quad, you're probably dealing more with like 8, 9, 10 dB input intercepts with that, uh, sorry, 8, 9 or 10 dB conversion losses with that kind of mixer. That extra loss makes it look better than it really is when you look at output referred. So here is, so we showed that the, the two tone is very good. Now what about the single tone? Well, it's also very good because it's a switching mixer. We don't get the intermod products and therefore we should have better two by twos and two by ones and all this. And indeed, indeed this is the case. Here's a down conversion example of a regular double balance mixer. Two by two spur is on the order of 50 or 60 dBc. Very typical number for a double balance mixer, maybe 70 if you're really, really getting, um, getting lucky. But uh, the T3 is down at 80, 90, 100 dBc at the exact same frequency. So that basically summarizes how the T3 is, is uh, created, um, more or less. I know this is IEEE, so you guys are probably furious that I'm not showing you the actual circuit, but um, Unfortunately, it is what it is. But uh, there are definitely some great advantages to the T3. I mean, obviously, linearity, bandwidth, flexibility of LO drive, which is critical. Um, in a single mixer, I can either drive it at plus 13 or plus 25. I don't actually have to specify a different diode. And, and that's unique compared to standard double balance mixers where the diode level sets the linearity. I can basically choose the linearity depending on how much LO I'm willing to give. However, there are drawbacks, as, as with anything, when you're buying a Mercedes or, or a Ferrari or a Rolls Royce, you're gonna pay more. This mixer is definitely probably the highest cost surface mount mixer um, in the market. And um, I guess thankfully for us, it solves so many, so many second and third order problems for our customers and reduces their bomb cost that they're actually willing to spend more money to get a really good engine. And so it actually, is a game changer in terms of architecture um, improvements. The size cannot be reduced beyond really what the ferrite balance cores can do. And we've already made them, I think, as small as they can go. They're not getting smaller. And so the smallest T3 right now is about 
uh, a third of an inch by a third of an inch, and it will never get smaller than that. Also, the profile is reasonably tall compared to other surface mount products. It's probably uh, 100 to 120 mil tall, and a lot of people would prefer less than 50 mil tall. It's handmade, so it's hard to ramp up. Uh, it requires really high level assemblers. These, the people that are building these are the best assemblers we have. Simulations are fruitless. Trust me, I've tried. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no gain to be had by spending all that time and money on the simulation because it's not going to work out. Uh, and that's primarily because the ferrite models are just not good enough. And because of the complexity of the circuit, it's, it's, if you open it up, it'll look like a rat's nest to, a, to a, um, a novice. And it'll look like you can't believe that somebody did this by hand. And I guess that's a good thing because it's intimidating. But it's really not practical beyond 20 gigahertz. And the other thing is that beyond 10 gigahertz, you have limited improvement in terms of the square wave capability. If you recall, in this plot, you can see that that, that plot's going down almost linearly, but not exactly. And around 10 gigahertz, we see this kind of knee. And that knee is true, and that knee exists because we're no longer getting odd harmonics into the mixer. Above 15 to 20 gigahertz, it's just a fundamental mixing.